percentage yield, what we're looking at is we're still taking the, um, the information that we've learned from our lesson on stoichiometry and our lesson on limiting reactants, and we're going to kind of go a little bit beyond that. Okay? We have something called the theoretical and the actual yield. Chemists use stoichiometry to, to predict the amount of product that can be expected from a chemical reaction. The amount of product that is predicted by stoichiometry is called the theoretical yield. So whenever you do a calculation, okay, when we go through, remember how we do the, the mole ratio and we find out um, you know, how many moles of the unknown with what we've been given, that is considered the theoretical yield. Okay. That's the theoretical yield. Okay. So anytime you make a calculation, okay, so your calculation, your calculations. That's your theoretical yield. Okay. The amount of product that is obtained in an experiment is called the actual yield. Because not all of it will be, you know, so what we're trying to figure out is based on what we're supposed to get with what we actually get, what percentage do we, do we actually obtain, right? So it's really important because if we were, you know, a chemist and we're trying to to create a certain type of compound, right? and we want to maximize our costs, we want to make sure that however much we are able to obtain, that our actual and our theoretical is, isn't off by very much. Right? Because if we're buying certain chemicals, uh, certain reactants, we want to make sure that we're able to maximize the amount that we, we make. Okay. The actual yield of chemical reactions is usually less than the theoretical yield. Okay, collection techniques can result in a lower than expected yield. A reduced yield may also be caused by a competing reaction. So what we have is another reaction that is competing for that final reaction. So we'll see that in the following example here. We have competing reaction is a reaction that occurs at the same time as the principal reaction and involves its reactants and or products. So we have the following. Two phosphorus plus three chlorine to produce two uh, molecules of phosphorus trichloride. Okay, But note that of this phosphorus trichloride that we're, okay, our final product in this reaction, that's the reaction we want. But in this reaction, what happens is, look at this product. It's the same product as the reaction of this first type. And look at what it's reacting with. It's reacting with whatever excess chlorine was there for the initial reaction. Okay, so we're exposing phosphorus to chlorine gas to produce what we want to produce, phosphorus trichloride. But at the same time, there's another separate competing reaction, which is competing with the chlorine that's still within and it's further kind of reacting to form something else, and that's not what we want. Okay, we don't want that, but that's what's happening. So there, there's a competing reaction that's occurring. And so because of that, right, the actual amount might be less than our theoretical. Because mathematically, okay, through stoichiometry, we're gonna get X amount. But because of this competing reaction that's occurring, this actual amount is actually going to be less than our theoretical. What we have here is this is the reaction that we want. Okay. This is the reaction that we want. But what happens is once this reaction, we want this reaction to stop. But the reason why it doesn't stop, looking at this, what is the limiting reactant? What runs out first? Phosphorus, okay, phosphorus is the limiting, which means the chloride or the chlorine gas is in excess. Because it's in excess, when we create this final product, there's a further competing reaction that's occurring. That's why this reaction is taking place, because there's excess chlorine 
in the reaction, right? Because if phosphorus is the limiting reaction, this reaction stops once the phosphorus runs out. But there's a competing reaction that is taking advantage of that excess chlorine and is going to lower, okay? It's actually going to lower the, um, the actual yield from the theoretical. Okay. It's going to lower it because there's that further step that's taking place. Right? We're not able to obtain the maximum amount of that because a, good, you know, a certain portion of it is going to continue to further get broken down. Calculating percentage yield. The percentage yield of a chemical reaction compares the mass of the product obtained during the experiment, which is the actual yield, with the mass of the product determined by stoichiometric calculations. Okay, as we said, theoretical yield, theoretical, in theory, what can we produce? Okay, using stoichiometry. And then what is actually being produced? And actually figure out what percentage do we have um, of our final product. Okay, and here's the final, the actual equation. So the percentage yield is equal to the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. And as we said, this theoretical yield, we use stoichiometry. So we divide the two, multiply it by 100 to get our final answer as a percentage. Let's look at a simple sample problem here. Uh, if 185 grams of lead to sulfide was actually obtained in a reaction for which the theoretical yield was 239 grams, calculate the percentage yield. Okay, so real simple. So we have to get the percentage yield, percentage yield is equal to actual over theoretical times 100. So, what is the actual? Okay, there's the actual 185 grams. The theoretical okay, the theoretical 239, so we get 185 grams divided by 239 grams. Grams cancel out, so we have no more units, times 100 to give us our percentage. And our percentage, remember we have three significant digits in our question, so our answer must have also three significant digits, which is? So 185 divided by 239 will give us 77.4%. So look at a slightly more difficult Sample problem. Upon heating, sodium metal combines with chlorine gas to form solid sodium chloride. If 8.30 grams of sodium and 14.0 grams of chlorine are heated together, a total of 19.5 grams of sodium chloride is isolated. Determine the percentage yield. There are a few extra steps that we have to do. Okay, so here what we need to do is make sure that we do go through the whole stoichiometric problem. Okay. So first thing in terms of stoichiometry, what is it? What do we want to start with? Write the equation. Okay, so we have sodium plus chlorine, and remember chlorine is diatomic produces sodium chloride. Okay. So to balance this, well, we have two chlorine, so we want two chlorine, and we have now two sodium. Okay, so right now what we have, okay, let's put down some of the information that we have for each one. So in terms of sodium, we have 8.30 grams of sodium. We have 14.0 grams of chlorine, and we have 100, or sorry, 19.5 grams of sodium chloride. Now, what we want to do is 
we're going to put this aside. Put this aside for now. Now, we want to know if we combine the two together, okay, how many moles really can we have of each one? Okay? So what we want to do is we want to take that step that we took last class where we looked at the limiting reactant. We want to figure out how many moles, okay, how many moles of sodium Okay, will be made if we have 8.30 grams, and how many moles of chlorine will we have if we have 14 grams of it? Okay, so take a moment and find the number of moles of each one. To find out the number of moles of sodium, okay, remember the uh, our pyramid. We have molar mass, mass and the number of moles. So to find that, we cover up the number of moles and we're dividing the mass by the molar mass. So we have 8.30 grams divided by the molar mass of sodium, which is 23.0 grams per mole, which will give us 0.361 moles. Okay. We want to do the same thing we want to find the number of moles now of chlorine. So we take the mass, 14.0 grams, and we divide it by 71.0 grams per mole to give us 0 0.197 moles. Okay. Now, if we're going to stop there for a quick second. We're going to look over now at our product, 19.5 grams. Is that an actual or a theoretical? That is? Actual. actual. Okay. This is the actual. Which means we're going to need to find the theoretical. Okay. We're going to need to find the theoretical, but we can't figure that out. We've got it. We, we can use the, um, the chart, right? So we've got uh, okay, our chart here. Okay, our three parts. And the part that we want to put first is the part that we want to find. We want to find the number of moles of um, sodium chloride. moles to molecules. We have how many moles of sodium? 0 0.361. How many moles of chlorine? We have 0 0.197. How many molecules of sodium chloride do we have? Two. Two. How many of sodium? Two. Two. And chlorine? One. Okay. So what we want to do now is we need to figure out how many moles of sodium chloride we can produce. So to do that, okay, to do that, we do what we did the last time, all right? We want to find between these two, but then we also have to do one more. We got to compare, bless you, the chlorine with the sodium chloride. Why? What are we doing right now? What are we trying to find? We're trying to find the S, the number of moles, but why can't we just use one? Why do we have to use both of them? We have to find the limiting reactant. We need to know. We, we can figure out one, but if we don't know what the limiting reactant is, we cannot really find out exactly, or theoretically, what, how many moles we've, we, we've, we've calculated or how many moles we're going to produce of sodium chloride because we don't know which one of these two is it the sodium or the chlorine that is going to run out first. Okay, So take a moment and find out the number of moles that, each, that uh, sodium is going to create of sodium chloride and how many moles of sodium chloride will be produced from that many moles of chlorine. What we're going to do is, remember when we were using this chart, we separate the moles 
to molecules, and we treat it as if it's a, you know, a set of uh, ratios. Okay? And we treat that as if it's an equal sign. So what we're going to do is we are going to find out sodium to sodium chloride to find, find out how many moles of sodium chloride are we going to form okay, using the uh, mole, uh, the number of moles of sodium. So we've got x over 0 0.361 equals 2 over 2. All right? So 2 over 2 becomes 1 over 1. And when we bring the 0 0.361 over, all right, so the number of moles are equal to one another, 0 0.361 moles. So if we have 0 0.631 moles of sodium, we're also going to have 0 0.61 moles of sodium chloride. Okay. But we're going to do the same thing now, but now it's not sodium to sodium chloride, it's going to be chloride to sodium chloride. Or sorry, chlorine gas to sodium chloride. So we have X over 0 0.197 equals how many molecules? We have is 2 over 1. So when we bring the point not 197 over, we've got x moles of uh, sodium chloride is equal to 0 0.197 times 2 over 1, which will give me 0 0.3. So, look at how many moles of NaCl we will produce using that much sodium. This much and this much. Which one will run out first? Hmm? The sodium. Because the sodium is going to produce less moles of sodium chloride. So, do we all get it? We, when we calculate the number of moles of each one, which one is lower? This one is the lower one between the two. Which means sodium is going to run out before chlorine does. Because chlorine is making so many more moles of sodium chloride. But really, we're not going to be able to do that because this is where it ends. Okay, so this is the number of moles of sodium chloride that we are actually going to make, or theoretically going to make. Okay. Which means we don't need that. Okay. So we know that the limiting reactant, okay, the limiting reactant is sodium. Which means when sodium runs out, the reaction ends. And we are only going to produce 0 0.361 moles of sodium chloride. But we don't want that. We want to find out the mass, theoretical mass, of sodium chloride. So what do we do now? We multiply this by? By the molar mass of? Sodium chloride. Okay. So we're going to multiply it by the molar mass of sodium chloride. Right. So when we do that, so we get 0 0.361 moles times the molar mass of sodium chloride, which is 58.5 grams per mole. Moles cancel out, and I'm left with 21.1 grams of NaCl. So 21.1 grams of NaCl is what? It's the theoretical mass of sodium chloride. That's the theoretical. Okay. Theoretical. 
Now, to find the, the percentage yield, what are we going to do? We're going to divide the actual, right, 19.5 grams by the theoretical 21.1 grams. Grams cancel out. We're going to multiply it by 100. And we get a, the uh, percentage yield of? So 92.4%. Right. We want three significant digits. So is that a good percentage? Have we uh, were were we able to obtain a lot of the uh, the product? Yes. Okay. So here we have the last sample problem. Calcium carbonate can be thermally decomposed to calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. Under certain conditions, this reaction proceeds with a 92.4 percent yield of calcium oxide. How many grams of calcium oxide can the chemist expect to obtain if 12.4 grams of calcium carbonate is heated? Okay, so we break this down. We've already got the equation, we didn't have to do that. Okay, but it's the first step, you wanna start off with the equation. So, from here, let's look at some of the givens. Well, we have 12.4 grams of calcium carbonate. We want we get a 92.4% yield of calcium oxide. So it's calcium oxide that we're trying to figure out. Okay. That's what we're trying to figure out. So, if we've got 12.4 grams of calcium carbonate, what can we find about calcium carbonate from here? What are we always trying to find? Moles, right? We can find molar mass, which will help us find the number of moles. Okay? So, we have 12.4 grams, okay, calcium carbonate. And we're going to divide it by the molar mass of calcium carbonate, which is 100.09 grams per mole. So grams cancel out, and I will have 0 0.1239 moles of calcium carbonate. Okay. So we have our chart. So moles, molecules. So, calcium uh, oxide and calcium carbonate. We have 0 0.1239 moles. We want to find the number of moles of calcium oxide. And in this reaction, I believe the reaction is already balanced. Let's double check. Yes, it's already balanced. So, the ratio is... One to one. Okay, so pretty simple, right? So we want to find out the number of moles of calcium oxide, but if it's a one to one ratio of molecules, it should be the same ratio of moles. So calcium carbonate has 0 0.1239 moles, but if it's a one to one ratio, then it's got the same number of moles, right? 0 0.1239 moles. Okay. So we have that many moles of calcium oxide. What do you think we're going to try to find next? The mass of calcium oxide, right? So we want to find the mass of calcium oxide. To do that, we've got to find what of calcium oxide? The molar mass. So we're going to take, so we want calcium oxide, and we have 0 0.1239 moles times the molar mass of calcium oxide, which is 56.08 grams per mole. So moles cancel out, 
And we're left with 6.948 grams of calcium oxide. 6.948 grams of calcium oxide. Is that the actual or the theoretical? Theoretical. Okay. So that's the theoretical. But do I have an actual? Yeah. No, that's of my pro that's my reactant. Oh, I want to find out of my product. So we use a percentage yield, right? We have a percentage yield. 92.4%. Okay, is our yield. Okay. So our actual, okay, our actual. Our actual yield is equal to 6.948 times 92.4%. But remember, we always want to divide it by 100. Okay. So what is the actual mass of calcium oxide? Six point four one. This is one nine nine, so six point four two zero. So six point four two zero grams, but we want how many significant digits? Three, right? So the answer is 6.42 grams is the actual. So that is actually how much we're going to be able to extract from our experiment. 6.42. But theoretically, we should be able to extract 6.948 grams. But it's still a very good percentage. Wait, what's the That's the percentage yield that we get. So now we're kind of working backwards. Remember how we had the percentage yield is equal to actual divided by theoretical? But we're given the actual. Sorry, we're given the theoretical and we're given the percentage yield. So what we're wanting to do is we're kind of just rearranging our equation. So, let me break this down here. So, we've got percentage yield, okay, is equal to actual, theoretical, times 100. So, what information do we have? Well, we have 92.4, okay, percent. We're trying to find the actual. Theoretically, we have, how much do we make? 6.948 grams okay. times 100. Okay. So what we're going to do is 92.4 is equal to x times 100 will give me 100x, so let's think math, divided by 6.948. So what we want to do is we want to isolate for x. So we're going to bring this from the denominator across the equal sign, so it becomes multiplication. So 92.4 times 6.948. Nine four eight. We so, and it is equal to one hundred x. I want to isolate for x, so I'm going to divide this by a hundred, which means I'm dividing this by a hundred as well. Okay, so I'm multiplying, or I'm dividing these two together. Right, I'm converting my percentage into a decimal because remember, percent 
always change it to a decimal. Once you have that, then multiply by the 6.984, 948, which we already did.